In this video, I want to introduce you to how to derive a demand curve, at least graphically, using budget constraints and Let's a difference. Let's just get some practice in illustrating, um, illustrating our optimal bundles. And so, uh, here I've, I've provided a table of information. Um, we've got uh, a couple of goods here. We've got flying alarm clocks, and we've got all other goods. So this is how we can, this is our convention for simplifying the, uh, the world into a world with only two goods. There are only two goods in this world, and we've got a good that we're interested in, and then a composite good that, by convention, we set the price equal to one. Let's go ahead and graph the budget constraint if the price uh, for the good that we're interested in, flying alarm clocks in this case, is 20. So, again, as with the previous videos, what we do with budget constraints is we ask how much of all other goods could we buy. In this case, each one costs one. There's a, there are a hundred dollars available, so we can buy a hundred all other goods uh, if we spend all of our money on that. And we can ask how much of the good that we're interested in can we buy? How many flying alarm clocks can we buy if we spend all of our money? Again, twenty dollars into a hundred, well that's five. So our budget constraint for this first point connects the dot from a hundred to five. Now I provided some more information here. I said that the optimal bundle, that's what this table is telling us is optimal bundles, has two flying alarm clocks. Now spending two flying alarm clocks each at a price of twenty means we spend forty dollars and we have sixty dollars left over on all of the goods. So there's sixty dollars on all of the goods, two flying alarm clocks, there's bundle A, and if you remember from our utility maximization video, at bundle A we have a tangent and difference curve to that budget constraint. Well, let's actually draw the budget constraint first. In, uh, again, we can buy a hundred of all other goods, because the price of all other goods is always one dollar. If we spend all of our money on flying alarm clocks, well now, at this lower price, we can buy ten. So we connect the dot from ten to a hundred. So there is our new budget constraint. Now, this new optimal bundle has five flying alarm clocks. Go ahead and draw a dotted line up to there. And we'll notice that if we spend five, five uh, if we buy five flying alarm clocks, each at a price of ten dollars, that spends fifty dollars. Subtract that from a hundred, and we have fifty dollars spend on the other goods that we want in our consumption bundle. So there is point B. And as with point A, um, as with all optimal bundles, we illustrate this with a tangent and difference curve, which I'll label UB with it for a utility level of B. Let's do this last one a bit more quickly. We have a price of five. If we spend all of our money at a price of five on flying alarm clocks, we sure would have a lot of flying alarm clocks. We would have 20. So there's a point on our budget constraint. Again, the price of all of the goods doesn't change, so we can connect this dot here. Straight line. And so we have got some good practice with drawing some indifference curves and some budget constraints. As, as you can see, when we change the price, we can trace out a price expansion path of sorts. As we, as we decrease the price, the budget constraint pivots out like this, and we get a whole new set of optimal bundles. Well, it turns out that that's just called our demand curve. It's a relationship between the price of that good and its quantity. And so we can strip that information off of this graph, and that'll tell us where our demand curve comes from. So let's go ahead and look at this here. Remember, our price was 20 for this red bundle here. And we know that we have a quantity of 2. So there's 20 and 2. So bundle, I'll call it A, or not, that's not a bundle, that is a point. I'll call it A prime. 
There's the price of 20 and the quantity of 2. We can go ahead and do this again, tracing down from our indifference curve and budget constraint down to our demand curve space. See that the at a price of 10, which is what defined this budget constraint, we can go ahead and get our quantity of 5. So we trace the quantity down here. We think about well, what was the price for that budget constraint. It was 10 because our income of 100 could buy us 10 flying alarm clocks, so that must mean that the price was 10. And so there's a point B prime on our demand curve. This third point, trace the quantity of 12 down here. We notice that at this quantity of 12, it must have been that the price was 5, because if we look at this graph, we know that our flying alarm clocks, we can, if we spend all of our money on flying alarm clocks, we can buy 20. Just reversing the, uh, the math that got us this intercept, we could, we could deduce just from looking at this graph that the price must have been $5 per alarm clock. So let's go ahead and draw that in here. So there is another point on our demand curve. And we could go ahead and do this continuously through this plane. We could just change the price by just a little bit and see how the consumer responds. If we go ahead and do that, we can actually connect a whole series of points and it will trace out what we like to call our demand curve. So that's where a demand curve comes from in economics, and hopefully this gave you a little bit of practice in illustrating optimal bundles on an indifference curve and budget constraint diagram, and also showing you where demand curves come from. It comes from varying this budget constraint and looking to see where the quantity, how the quantity on the x-axis changes, varying the budget constraint merely by changing the price of the good on the x-axis.